to Seattle Atheist Church. At Seattle Atheist Church, we call ourselves an atheist church because you will never hear anything supernatural promoted from the podium. Our church was founded on the principles of scientific naturalism and secular ethics. Truth claims are attempted here, and we stand ready to revise our thinking in light of new information. We attempt to be excellent to all conscious beings, and we believe in good, because good works in non-mysterious ways. So, uh, welcome to our Easter service. Um, I see we have a lot of new people. So the first thing is that at Seattle Atheist Church, um, it's, we're a welcoming place. Sometimes you hear about the Seattle freeze. Um, it certainly doesn't feel that way here. And so, um, Hopefully, you know, people have had a chance to talk to you or whatever before church. Um, but if you are a new person, you just at least kind of give a wave around. You feel that the um, folks who come here can see you. So welcome. Um, let's see. The first Friday of the month, which hasn't happened yet, right? There's going to be movie night. And the movie is um, about, oh, it's about Jane Goodall's life. So sign up for that on the um, website. Um, spaces are limited, but it's a lot of fun. So hope, we hope that you will join us. Uh, the way that we do it here is the members ourselves give the talks. So um, it'll be like something very different every week. Uh, the members ourselves give the talks. What we like to do is have coffee for about 15 minutes, then have a 20, 30 minute talk, and then we get in a circle and we have a discussion for about an hour. Um, and then afterwards, uh, what we decided last week is that we want uh, to end a little early, so about an hour of discussion, and then if people want to continue talking and go up to like somebody you know or whatever, you may, the, the room is still open. So, um, so that's what to expect. Um, the uh, way that we pay for the room is through the donation jar in the back. If you'd like to swipe a credit card, Troy, right there in the back row, can do that for you or you could do it at the meetup site. So um, if you're new, please don't feel any pressure to donate, uh, but if you are a regular member and you like to keep this going, that's how we do it. Okay, so without further ado, welcome on up. Hi, so my name is Laura, and um, today I wanted to talk about a topic it's actually a little bit different probably than the topic that was listed. So first off, my apologies for anyone who thought that this is a tutorial on how to, to come to authentic awe. I don't have any answers today. Um, I said I had a description for this and it was different than what got posted initially. So this might be a little off topic for some people. But um, about three weeks ago, I came and we were doing a planning meeting. I didn't realize we were doing a planning meeting for the lectures and I threw in the idea of awe without woo. And for those people who are new, woo is sort of shorthand for woo-woo. And so that idea of something that's not supernatural. So woo is a supernatural thing. So the reason I threw that idea out there is because I had a conversation with someone who was here. Um, after one of our meetups, um, after one of the lectures, he just sort of took me aside and, and asked me a question. Uh, a young kid, probably about half my age, comes from a very um, strict, religious upbringing, um, I believe Muslim, but I'm not entirely sure. And he said, what do you do, how do you replace the feeling of a religious experience if you don't believe in God anymore? Which was such an interesting question, and I wondered why he asked me, because I felt like the least qualified person to answer the question, because I've never had a religious experience. So we talked for about 15 minutes, um, and I just, if I had more time, I probably would have asked him what he meant by that. A little bit more about, well, what are you trying to get at? And I really talked about feelings of awe, because I certainly have feelings of awe. Um, you know, that sort of feeling of the chills that you get after you see something amazing in nature, or if you hear a beautiful piece of music, or you've read some uh, poetry, or had somebody seen a performance that just really moved you. I've had those feelings. I was actually raised Christian, um, but, have never ever believed in it. So, you know, it wasn't until I was an adult when I went, you know, this is really not for me. 
So I was like, I'm really not able to say if that's even possible. So that's where I came from, wanting to come up with that idea. And so then when it got voted as a thing to talk about, I got volunteered, so to speak, to talk about it. And then I went, well, I don't know what I'm going to say. So part of my idea was hopefully um, just a jumping off point, because I feel like other people may have had religious experiences or things that they might have felt were spiritual in nature, even in the group, that could perhaps talk about what that means to them. So that meant that I had to go on sort of a research dive, if you will. I did a couple of things. One of the things that I did was I started talking to people about what they felt were religious experiences if they had them. The interesting thing when I was having that conversation with the young man was I felt like awe was not enough. That a religious or spiritual experience would be something like awe plus, if you will, right? Awe plus what? Awe plus love. Or awe plus connectedness. Or awe plus something. Transcendence, right? What does that mean? Um, a few of the people that I spoke to, my background is my religious background. My, my mother, mainly, was um, involved in church, still is involved in churches that are sort of low-key, if you will, not a lot of rituals involved, so American Baptist Methodist churches. Sort of just loosey-goosey, you could come into a church dressed however you wanted to. There wasn't a lot of repetition. We'd sing a lot of hymns, but there was not like one certain thing we did. Um, I was actually surprised by how ritualistic some of the other Christians faiths were, like Catholicism. I went to someone's Catholic wedding once, and within the wedding there was all this ritualistic stuff. Or like I went to Pacific Lutheran University, and in the choir we had to sing at all of the, all of the church services. And it was sort of like Catholicism light, where there were certain things you taught at a certain time. It was really, I was like, I didn't, everyone else knew what to do, and I'm like, I don't know what's happening here. So you just learn when you get up, sit down, kneel. So one of the things um, that would come up with the people that came from my background, <coughs> sort of the non-entrenched ritual, it was like a personal relationship with another being. And the people that would talk about it wouldn't talk about like these transcendent experiences, but more feeling of safety and purpose, right? So I feel safe. If something bad happens to me, that's okay, I'm gonna be taken care of. Sort of uh, almost parental, right? Whereas some of the other people that I spoke to that came from like Catholicism and other types of religion, they really did talk about these sort of transcendent experiences. <laughs> or like meeting Jesus or talking to someone really feeling like a sense of a presence in the room. Like there was really something beyond them. And that's something, again, it was hard for me to wrap my brain around because I've never had that experience. Um, some of these people have actually, my roommate said he met Jesus while he was, after he spoke pop. And you couldn't see the irony in that for me because it didn't, it didn't, it didn't take away from his belief that he met Jesus, the fact that he was in an altered state of consciousness. Whereas that's the first thing I suspect is like, okay, well, I have a hard time taking you seriously because you are high and I don't. So for me, that was sort of subject to interpretation. So in terms of these little bits, right? Like, what does that mean? And so when I started reading a little bit about neuroscience, I'm like, okay, what happens to our brain, right? What is going on here? You know, because all of this stuff is subjective. And what I was looking at, um, although the studies are, everything is so subjective, there's this whole thing about neurotheology, which hopefully someone else has heard of. Um, you know, not knowing where you could get the, the sort of scientific take on it. I was really looking at some studies where they were saying, here's deep feelings, again, of being cared for, safe, but then beyond that, what's it like? So looking at online articles um, and looking at neurotheology, I was, I, I was thinking of it as, this is your brain, this is your brain on religion, right? And the ones I was looking at mainly were where they were looking at actually MRIs of people that were having religious experience. So they've done brain scans. Some people are not in the head, so hopefully they've seen some of this. The particular one, before I even get into that, some of the components that people have said that were connected to religious experience, again, with spiritual awe, oneness with the universe, and these feel very subjective to you, what does that mean? Um, ecstatic trances, um, 
often sudden enlightenment or understanding, maybe an epiphany, and then maybe altered states of consciousness. So the experiments that I was looking at, the brain scan experiments, um, I'm trying to find his name, I suddenly forgot it, Andrew Newberg. Andrew Newberg is a neuroscientist, basically has done MRI scans of people that are participating in what he calls a spiritual activity. And so to him, a spiritual activity would be Buddhist chanting, a Franciscan nun's praying. It could also be meditation, but it tends to be meditations that are connected to mantras, not just straight up meditation. And what he found when he looked at the brain scan of someone participating in these events, generally speaking, the other ones he looked at were um, Pentecostal uh, uh, believers who spoke in tongues, and then um, Brazilian mediums who believed that they were channeling the dead when they were writing. There's a term for it, I forget what it's called. Um, but in most of the activities, let's say the chanting nuns, the mantra meditation, um, sorry, the chanting Buddhas, the prank nuns, mantra meditation, when you look at the brain scans, they basically showed um, different activity than in the resting brain. The main differences in the activity were in the frontal lobes. So after or during chanting and praying and mantra-based meditation, um, the frontal lobes were activated. So they talk, he talks about the frontal lobes as being an area of the brain mainly responsible for directing attention, uh, managing behavior, and expression language. Um, that these became more active in people that were experiencing this kind of thing. And it didn't matter which kind of, if they were religious, which religion, if they were doing these sort of similar what I call sort of repetitive ritualistic things, chanting the same chant, praying the same prayer, using mantras over and over again, this happens. Um, the other thing that he noticed though, I find this fascinating, is that there's a decrease in the parietal lobe. And this tends to, this is an area of the brain that sort of tells you where you are in, in space, in three dimensional space. So I, the closest I've come to knowing what it's like to have this decrease Sorry. So, um, I have had this experience, but I didn't think it was religious. I once moved to a place um, where I had a different bed, and the bed was like really high off the ground. It was like, like it's always up here. And then during the first couple of weeks that I moved there, I was I had gone from driving a giant van to a very low car, and I was a case manager for the YWCA, so I was driving like most of my work was driving, and then most of my time because I was. I only had a room to myself in the place. I was on my bed. It was all the furniture I had. And for two weeks, I felt like I was in the wrong space. I could, I, or if anyone's ever had glasses and it took them off to adjust to where the ground was, it was like that times 50. It was weird, it was so weird. I didn't attribute to me. I'm like, I had had such a, it was obvious to me that there was something that's like, look, I'm spending my time in different places than I'm used to being, so this is probably affecting my ability to interpret where I am in the world. But it's the closest thing I could come to, to that idea um, of not of having that sense of yourself being displaced. And so when they looked at, Newberg was saying that when he looked at that being decreased, he wondered if that may explain that sort of oneness with the universe, which is, I might not know where I end, and something else begins. And so if I have that decrease in activity in my brain, then my sense is being affected in such a way that I feel like I am no longer separate from the universe or however else you interpret it. What, the other things I found fascinating in his work, um, there, were, there were, again, the other categories that Pente Pentecostal folks were speaking in tongues, they actually had a decrease in their frontal lobes. And this is interesting because you would think because they're sick of using so-called language that that wouldn't be the case. Um, you would think because they're verbalizing something, you would still have activity up here. Um, he said, well, that could be the case for somebody outside, like a believer could say, well, if it's not coming from inside their brain, it must be coming from outside their brain, and then there's the proof that they're channeling something. This was also true of the people that were doing the, um, the handwriting, the, the people that were supposedly communicating with the dead in Brazil. The other case, unfortunately, is anecdotal. They apparently have one subject that he, um, his code name is Kevin, which is funny to me because Kevin's my little brother. Um, Kevin was a staunch atheist, and 
They went ahead and did a brain scan of Kevin when he was doing meditation. And what Newberg found when he did that brain scan is that the increase in activity actually happened in the prefrontal lobe. And so this, he said, this person tended to be analytical even when they were resting or participating in this activity. So even though he was doing similar stuff, the area of the brain that was activated was the area that was dealing with controlling emotion and input of sensory information to the brain. So, and I was like, oh, I wish he'd done more than one. Why is there only one? Because maybe Kevin just is like that, right? Maybe this particular person just happens to be like that. So, I just found that very interesting. Um, and then, has, has anyone heard of the God helmet? The God helmet experiment, I found that fascinating too. So, um, <clears throat> the God helmet is basically, oh, see, I keep losing the names of the people. Is it Persinger? He postulated that um, you could use electrodes. So they created a helmet with electrodes. And you could manipulate um, electromagnetic field around the lobes of the brain and possibly produce religious experiences. And he claimed that about 80% of his subjects actually did experience something, but they didn't all label them experiences that were religious. What's interesting is some of them label it as, well, basically they felt a presence in the world. Some people interpret that presence as God, some of the subjects interpreted as angels, some of the people interpreted as aliens, um, and some of them as ghosts. Um, when Richard Dawkins put the helmet on, apparently he just felt dizzy and had some tingling in his legs. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the person here said, well, maybe, and this to me is interesting, a direction to go, and I, I wanted to do a little more reading, I didn't get to it before. He said, well, maybe some people are just genetically predisposed to have, to sense religious interactions. And I went, maybe people are just genetically predisposed to sense differences in the atmosphere, in, in fields, right? So, so why would I then assume, to me it's almost like here's the subjective belief. For, for some reason, this person believes that God would be the reason that there is a change in my perception. This person might say, okay, well, it's a, it's a ghost. It's a, you know, it's a relative that's trying to shout to me. This place is haunted. And then somebody else, maybe someone skeptical, just notices that they feel weird. Um, and I started thinking about, well, maybe that's just how we're trained to feel. So thinking about those people that maybe grew up with Catholicism, maybe their brain has been sort of tuned through, not sort of Catholicism, Buddhism, whatever that thing is, right? Through ritual has been sort of attuned to being put in these states, and then interpreting these states as a connection to God or the universe or whatever that belief says it is. Whereas someone maybe like me or Richard Dawkins, when we're, we're experiencing something weird or outside of our own perception, we go, oh, I wonder what's happening here, or we don't even notice it, or we don't care so much. When I, had, when I spent that couple of weeks going, I feel like I'm too low to the ground for two weeks, so weird. I didn't go, wow, I, you know, I didn't feel it when, I did, definitely didn't feel it when with the universe, I just felt weird, <laughs> right? right? And then, I mean, this is all anecdotal too, but a lot of the people that I know that have a propensity to sort of, some of my more rational people that I know who have also experienced more drugs than I have, have sometimes interpreted things in ways I don't, it just seemed odd to me. It's like, that's an interesting choice. And it made me wonder if, because I hadn't had, and I, in this case, I mean psychotropic drugs, so like mushrooms or LSD, right? So, so maybe again, that idea, I spent the weirdest night once at a cabin because the person I was with, who claimed to be an atheist and not believe in anything spiritual, was very certain that the cabin was haunted and we went through the cabin all night long. She had a butcher knife in hand. Couldn't quite bring myself to ask her what she thought she would do with the butcher knife if we found a ghost, because it doesn't seem like that would be helpful. But, but she was very convinced, and um, she had a history of both alcohol, but also um, mushroom use and, and those kinds of things. And, and I, who knows if there is a connection there, but it made me wonder if, again, not having that experience, maybe my brain 
wasn't picking up on things and interpreting them that way. Um, so most of this research, most of this has been me going, not necessarily what's wrong with me, but why am I different? Why do I talk to people who've had similar upbringings who say, hey, I've had this experience. I've had this experience, a rich, you know, a, a, a religious experience or a spiritual epiphany or whatever that thing is. And I feel like I'm very skeptical, I always have been, but I do like to keep an open mind. I think a lot of the things that humans interpret as, as woo are things that we just don't understand yet. And maybe that comes from my not having the framework put in place where I can explain it away by saying, oh, this is God's One of the things that came out of uh, Newberg's work is those people that were having those religious experiences that didn't have a framework, when they felt like they were transcendent or out of place in the world or um, those, those areas of the brain were activated, they actually felt uncomfortable. But the people that, the nuns, the Buddhists, the Pentecostals, all those folks, they didn't have an issue with it because they had an explanation for it. But those people that didn't have like a pre-made explanation were like, okay, this is not cool. This is really strange or weird to me. So it makes me wonder, I mean, when I experience things that are weird or strange, I'll usually go, well, what else could be going on? It reminds me of, um, has anyone heard of the ghost frequency? It's one of my favorite things. So 18.98 hertz is something called an infrasound. Infrasounds are sounds that are so low frequency that human beings can't hear them. But your brain perceives them. So, um, let's see if I remember. So what, where this came out of is uh, an engineer, a British engineer named Vic Tandy had been told that the lab he was working in was haunted. And so he didn't really think much about it. He was working there late at night. And he suddenly he felt like there was a presence in the room, similar to that electromagnetic field experiment. And when he tried to, he thought he saw something out of the corner of his eye, but when he turned, it was gone. So, you know, he didn't immediately think, well, obviously it's haunted, but it was a little odd experience for him. And the next night that he worked there late at night, again by himself, he actually had brought in his foil. He was, um, um, what's the word? We, it's <laughs> sword fighting, right? So he was a sword fighter. Oh. Fencing. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. Sorry, fencing, sorry. Oh. Um, he's a fencer. <laughs> yeah, he should, that's what he needed was the different kind of foil. No, he brought in his foil, his sword, right? And he was, um, he was gonna polish it. And when he clamped it down, he noticed that it was vibrating. And so then he went, okay, I can't hear anything. I can't hear something that would cause vibration, but I can see it. And he was able to track down the faulty piece of equipment and find out what frequency at which it was, what the frequency it was putting out. And that's 18.98 hertz. And what that tends to do to the brain, it does a couple of things. Um, it usually causes discomfort, dizziness, blurred vision, hyperventilation and fear. And they've actually found some places where they thought, you know, people would say this place is haunted. They found one of the places there was a malfunctioning like industrial fan and they fixed the fan and there was no more hunting. So I was always fascinated by this. I don't think it can explain everything, but again, it's that perception that we have. If numerous people have the same perception, but they don't know how to explain it. I see something out of the corner of my eye, but when I look, it's gone. I'm afraid, I feel the presence in the room then we might go for what is what everyone else says, right? We're gonna go for the explanation that's been presented to us. It's haunted, somebody's there. Um, they looked at the same thing in, in religious um, paintings, where they would show what looked like UFOs in religious paintings. People would go, oh, from like 18th, 19th, or even further back to the 15th century, there'd be these things in the sky, especially in religious paintings, that look like what we think of as UFOs. And when they were looking at this, they were saying, well, this is proof that we've been visited by aliens. But the theory that's out there now is that these are probably just like comets that, that were observed in the sky, but they were attributed to God because that was the prevailing explanation for things that people couldn't explain. Whereas you get to modern times, the prevailing explanation might be a UFO. So even though it looks like this thing that we interpret one way, the mind from hundreds of years ago, or centuries of years ago, are gonna say this is God, someone else is gonna say this is an alien. 
So this led me to believe that maybe some of this is just a matter of interpretation. It's just your personal belief system that's already built for you, and then when something weird happens, you go, oh yeah, I think God was trying to tell me something. Or that person that always sees signs somewhere. I'm always fascinated by the person that sees signs somewhere for something positive, but they never seem to notice the negative signs. <laughs> or like, yeah, I knew that was going to happen. Well, what else did you know was going to happen? My sister's really fascinated by the fact she thinks she looks at the clock when it's 444, like all the time. And I'm like, well, it can't be 444 all the time. You have to look at clocks other times. You just don't remember it because it's not noticeable, right? I'm not going to notice every time I look at a clock. I'm just going to go, oh, that's weird. It's 444. So um, anyway, so those are, I don't have, again, didn't have answers. I was hoping to just kind of um, bring some research. Part of the problem with the research is that it tends to be, again, subjective. When they look at um, Newberg's um, brain scan um, experiments, the concern is that they have very small size. I think to date, he's only looked at 150 scans. But also, the subjects were given like a questionnaire before they did it that may have primed them to be thinking in a religious you know, aspect, right? I also, most of them are grad, most of the other ones were graduate students and kind of knew what the experiment was about. So it'd be interesting to see if somebody was replicating those kinds of experiments um, where people were not given sort of that predisposition to a religious experience idea, so maybe they wouldn't interpret it the same way. It's the same thing with the God helmet. That a lot of people, it was just notorious enough that it was hard to do, to replicate it. They, they haven't been able to re replicate it very well. So I find it fascinating. I think that some of it could also just be differences in structures and chemistry of our brain. You know, I was, I was thinking about it like a radio. Like maybe if a believer is right, maybe their antenna is just better to Or if a non believer is right, there isn't anything out there to tune to, maybe there's a problem with the equipment person that believes that they're getting a religious experience, they're just, they're just thinking that the little pops and crackles of malfunctioning equipment parts, they're just saying, well, this is God talking, or this is the universe telling me something. So um, so coming back to that whole all of that woo, I still don't have an answer for that young man, and he's not here, so that I was kind of hoping he'd be here so we could have more of a discussion. I would be really interested to see what he was asking me about. Um, because religious experience, it just seems like it means different things to different people. Um, I really appreciate when I'm able to feel awe about something. I'm very awed about science. Um, sometimes I read about a new discovery and I get that feeling all over that feeling. But I don't have that awe oh, plus kind of, I don't think I've ever had that. You know, I've, I've gone hiking and seen an amazing waterfall or I've listened, uh, this happens to me a lot with music where I get that just all over feeling of a chill, I'm just very moved by something. But I could never say that's a religious experience, it's just something that I appreciate. So 